Welcome to Goldfish on Games, where today we're checking out this office computer and hopefully turning it into a bit of a gaming rig. So let's upgrade my Pentium 4 small form factor. This is the HP Compact DC7600 SFF, and in this configuration it's a hyper-threaded Pentium 4 running at 2.8GHz. It has half a gig of RAM, a 165GB spinning Rust drive with onboard graphics and sound, topped off with a basic DVD drive. These are old business machines that you can find pretty much everywhere and typically for very little money, and they were not known for their gaming chops but a few choice upgrades can change all of that. But to get a better idea of what we'll be working with, we need to take a look round the back, as we'll find two full-sized horizontal slots for expansion, which, hint hint, we will come back to later. There are also a number of USB ports with Ethernet nestled just above it. And it's also got the connectors for video and sound, and we can't forget the all-important power connector. Opening this up, which is done via two tabs at the side, and then pulling the case over a bit like a pizza box, we find a packed but very nicely laid out machine. All I've really done so far is to replace that DVD drive, as the original was dead on arrival. Which was easy enough done, as the drive tray rotates up, giving you access to this tab that will unlock the drive. It's very quick, easy, and nicely designed. If we flip over the power supply, we can find the drive tucked away at the bottom, which I will replace with an SSD, as I've always wondered how fast XP would run on one of them. Now this is just 128 gigabytes, but that'll be more than enough for the OS and the games. Due to using SATA, this is a simple replacement job. Well, once you can push that tab out the way to release the drive, for some reason that takes a bit of effort. Once in the OS, which I chose Service Pack 3, due to having the SATA controller drivers already built in, we can see that it flies. It's actually a little shocking at how fast and smooth this feels. And it's definitely a worthwhile upgrade as these smaller drives are getting cheaper all the time. The next upgrade is also pretty straightforward, as it's adding one extra gigabyte of RAM. As 1.5 gig in total should be more than enough for the games that I have in mind. There's four slots in total with one already in use, so this will take up two more, so there is a spare one if I want to add more RAM later. I want to benchmark the stock hardware so we have a baseline for later, as it's sporting the Intel Graphics Media Accelerator 950, which came out in the same year as this machine, 2005. And to get some hard numbers that we can compare against, let's use 3D Mark 05, which runs three graphics demos using various effects to get an idea of the power of the machine. And yes, you are reading that number right. It's running at 1 to 3 frames a second. And those results are repeated across all of the tests. Intel might have called this a graphics accelerator, but the only thing it's accelerating is my want to get a better graphics card. And the results are in and we got a grand score of 510. For comparison, one of the most powerful cards at the time, the ATI X800 XT, gets around 6,000 points. But with this being aimed at offices, it's not all that surprising it doesn't do all that well with games. But I feel we can fix that. So let's go back into the machine. And to start off with, we need to take off this cage and put it to one side, as we find a 1x PCI Express slot, a full size 16x PCI Express slot, and two PCI slots, and these all support half height cards. 
but if we look at that cage that we removed just a second ago, we find it contains a riser card. That connects to the PCI slot on the board that provides space for two full-sized PCI cards. Which poses a bit of a problem really, as the back of these came in two flavours. There's what I've got here, or there's the other layout with four half-size slots running vertically. So even if I wanted to use the half-height cards, they wouldn't really fit even if I took the brackets off them. But as they say, I have a plan. I hate it when that happens, which involves these two cards. An Odd G1, the SB0090, which will replace the very average internal sound card that, while works, did have a few issues with the sound cutting out while I was doing some testing. So I figured I would replace it as I had this card in storage anyway. And the other card is this, the AMD 7450 1GB graphics card. Which I chose after a lot of investigation as picking a card for this machine was much harder than you might expect. As it's got a tiny 240 watt power supply. So the card had to be low powered and not generate too much heat. So I went with this, a low-end, modern-ish graphics card that came out in 2012, as it has a maximum power draw of just 18 watts. And with the advancements in GPUs, this should be the equivalent of a top-end card from 2005. I had hoped to get myself an Nvidia 710, but those cards are highly sought after and go for almost double the cost of this one. With those in mind, how are we going to fit them? Well, with these, a PCI and PCIe extension cable. The first thing we'll need to do is remove the riser board from the cage, which just takes these two screws and it then slides out. We then want to connect the cables to both the cards, making sure that PCI1 is the right way round, as it will fit in either direction. That notch should be towards the back of the card, not the front. We're then going to screw it into the cage using the brackets, with the top slot being used for the sound card, and then obviously the lower slot gets the GPU, as well we need to give that fan a little bit of space. And as we can see, it all fits, but I'm not too happy with how the back of those cards move around. It is very easy for them to touch each other, which could result in something bad happening. So for now, I'm gonna use a bit of card to insulate them from each other, though we might come back to this later. The next step is to plug them into the computer itself, which as you can see, is a little bit fiddly and awkward, mostly due to how thick these ribbon cables are. but with a little bit of effort and persistence, they're in place. And we can now try and squeeze the cage and the cards back into place, which we find it all fits, but those cables are acting like a bit of a spring and trying to push the whole thing up. Unfortunately, there's no screw to hold the cage down, as it would have been held in place with that riser card. But overall, it shouldn't be a problem when we put the case back on. And before we go back into Windows, the first stop should be the BIOS, as I want to make sure that the onboard GPU and sound are disabled. I also want to go digging to try and disable hyperthreading, as this era of hyperthreading isn't a real core or anything, and to be honest, the games I want to run don't play all that nice with the extra cores. And thankfully, as we can see, HP didn't completely lock down this BIOS but some of the options aren't really in the menus you might expect. After a quick session of installing the drivers, we are then ready to run 3D Mark 5 again. And boy does this make a difference. We're seeing an almost 10 times increase in the frame rates, and we get that across all three demos as well.
and just look at that score. It's over 6,000! That puts it around about where the ATI X800 XT or the Nvidia 6800 would roughly be. Which is round about the top of the range for a card in 2005. Which is not bad for a small, cheap, low powered card from 2012. And as we did with the Pentium 3 just recently, let's take a look at a few games that I plan to run on it. First up is the game that this machine was more or less built for, Broken Sword Angel of Death. And the reason for this is simple, the game doesn't really like multiple cores or modern systems, so the machine we've just built is perfect for it. Now this was the fourth game in the Broken Sword series, and as we can see it's still in full 3D, but this one plays more like an adventure game than the third did. And I've also been told there's a lot less block pushing puzzles as well. So all I really need to do now is find a good block of time to play it. As I've finished all the other games in the franchise, this is the only one that I need to do. Quick, give me a hand with this grill. Sure. And I have to start the second game with a bit of a confession, because it's Tron 2.0. And yes, it can run on that Pentium 3, but really, it's on the P4 that it shines. Everything is turned up to the max, it's got a decent resolution, and it's absolutely amazing. And not only is this game nice and smooth, but it also supports the Ogigi's EAX sound system so it sounds as good as it looks. I've completed this game a few times, but the story and style keeps me coming back time and time again, and I do hope to rerun it soon, because this game is begging for a review. The third game is Star Trek Elite Force 2, and it's a great follow up to the adventures on Voyager, but this time we're on the flagship, the Enterprise E. The frame rate isn't really where we might expect, not that we're well over the recommended specs. And this highlights one of the issues with the ATI slash AMD drivers of the time, as there's actually a simple fix. Rename the XE to Quake 3, and just look at the difference that it's made, as it seems they wrote a custom pipeline for the ID Tech 3 games, but it was only ever used for the original Quake 3. But, obviously, if you rename it, then it'll go ahead and use it. It's a little bit annoying because you really shouldn't need to do this. But that aside, what we find is a great game. It looks better than before, and transferring to the Enterprise was a cool idea. The only real downside is that they removed the option to select between Alex and Alexander Munro. It's now just Alex for the entire game. Stop him! And I can hear the questions, does it run Crisis? Well, I have no idea, as I bought it on Steam and they removed official support for XP a few years ago. Thanks a lot Valve. So let's try Far Cry instead. And yes it runs! And on these settings it runs quite well. The only downside is those settings are low. I'm sure I should be able to push this much higher. But when I set all the settings to high, it runs at a crawl when you're outside. Which is odd, as the minimum specs are about a third the amount of the CPU power, and it's only asking for a GeForce 2 graphics card. I'm sure it's just one or two settings that are wrong, 
and I should be able to get it running quite nicely, if I do a bit of back and forth. But this was what PC gaming was all about. I doubt I need to say too much about this game, but if you've not played it, think of it as a more self-contained crisis, but with weird mutated creatures in the mid-game rather than aliens. But it still has those amazing vistas. And just a quick extra game at the end, Sid Meier's Railroads. A game you can get on Steam, but I found it has some issues on modern hardware and OS's. Hopefully this version doesn't have it as well, but we will see. But either way, this is a great little transport sim that has some interesting ideas. Like you can only build new tracks from old ones, so you have to keep expanding your rail network rather than just building small tracks between towns and industries. Graphics wise, this sits on the edge of the required specs, so you can see it chugging a little when moving. But seeing how badly some of the modern transport sims can run, I'm not too bothered. One thing I've hinted at was the cost of the machine, or I should say the lack of cost, as this was a pretty cheap build. The computer itself was £5 from a car boot sale, the DVD drive can be gotten for another fiver, the two risers were £10 in total, so again £5 each, and that was the same price for the RAM. The Ogigi I had spare, but you can get one of those for 12 quid, and the SSD was £14, as was the GPU. £65 in total, which would be just under 90 US dollars, which I think is a pretty decent price for a capable XP machine. Clearly this isn't going to win any speed records, but if I wanted more power then I could go with that Nvidia 710, which would almost double the GPU power, and only cost half of what I've already spent on the machine. There are a few other upgrades as well that could be done like a 3.4 GHz Pentium 4, but I think that might end up pushing the power envelope a little bit too much. It might also be worth replacing the fans, as I think some modern more powerful ones could really help with the airflow, as that graphics card got quite toasty. Were the rest of the upgrades worth it in the end? Well, I think so, as it plays the games I want to run reasonably well. The SSD makes the whole thing feel quick and snappy, and I've always been a fan of these desktop form factors. Even though some of the games didn't run as well as I hoped, I am still quite happy with the machine, and I'm sure we're going to be seeing more of it in the future. So until next time, I've been the Gouldfish, that was Punching Above Its Weight, and this was Gouldfish on Games. Thank you for watching my video, I do hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, you can let me know down in the comments, or you can use those buttons just below, you know the ones I mean. Or if you're not sure yet, then you can check out two other videos that I've done that are on the screen right now. So thank you again, and I hope to see you soon.